This program is brought to you by the faithful support of the friends and partners of Rick Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program with Rick Renner. Let's join Rick for a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Welcome to the program. My name is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. And I'm believing that today you're going to get something brand new from the Word of God. We're looking at what the Bible says about the end times, and particularly how to recognize the signs of the times. From the very beginning of time, people have been preoccupied with the future. And when we come to Matthew chapter 24, we find the disciples also were asking Jesus about signs of the times, or particularly how they would know when we had entered into the very last days of this age. At the time that Jesus was speaking to his disciples, the world was occupied by Roman forces. And particularly in Israel, they were tired of that. And there was a preoccupation with the future. People wanted to know, when is this going to end? How will we know when all this political turmoil will cease? And when it's time for Christ to set up his kingdom, how will we know when he's going to come again? How will we know when it's the very end of the age? And people generally throughout the Roman Empire, but particularly in Israel, were preoccupied with this question about the signs of the times. So when Jesus was with his disciples privately on the Mount of Olives, the disciples said, Lord, we'd like to ask you some private questions. And they begin to talk to Jesus about end time events. Interesting, these are the same questions which people have today. People are watching what's happening in politics, in the economy, in national boundaries, immigration, Israel, so many events that are happening in the world. And people are asking, how will we know concretely that all of these events point to the fact that it's the end of the age and it's time for Christ to come again? So there's no better place for us to look for those answers than Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus himself addresses these questions. And today we're going to begin again in verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. If you didn't see the last program, please go to the archive at our website and look it up because it is packed with information that we don't have time to cover again today. But very quickly, we're going to review verse 3, then move on. And Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, the Bible says, and as Jesus sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. So we find this is a private conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And they said, Tell us when these things shall be, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Very quickly, I want to cover these words again because they are very foundational to this chapter. First of all, they said, When shall these things be? We saw in the last program, the word when is the Greek word pote. It very concretely wants to know when exactly. This is not a general request for general information. They were asking very specifically, Lord, when? We want to know exactly when all of these end time events are going to take place. Secondly, they said, what shall be the sign of thy coming? The word what is the Greek word T, which describes the most minute, minuscule detail. It tells us emphatically the disciples wanted concrete details. They wanted detailed information. Lord, tell us exactly. We want to know what the sign of your coming will look like. We want to know when it will be. We want to know what we're going to see. They use the Greek word T, asking for explicit details. So first of all, they said, when concretely are these things going to happen? What exactly are we going to see? And they particularly wanted to know, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Well, you're going to find out that Jesus gives them many signs, but the disciples didn't know that. So when they were talking to Jesus, they just asked for one sign. And the word sign is the Greek word simeon. And the word simeon is the same identical word which was used to describe markers along a road. Just like if you're traveling to a city or to a destination, there are signs along the way that let you know where you are in your journey. And the closer you get to your destination, of course, the number of miles or kilometers becomes less and less and less. And by the signs you see, you know where you are along the road. That is the word that is used here. So the disciples were literally asking, Lord, what signs will we see along the prophetic road to let us know where we are in our journey to the end of the age? And that's concretely what they were asking. What will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? 
This word end is the Greek word suntelos, from the Greek word telos, which describes something that's mature or something that is complete. But when it is affixed to the word soon, it becomes the word suntelos. And this describes the closure of something, not something that's just mature, but something that's finished. It is the summation, it is the closure, or it is the wrap up. You can't go any further than this. You've come to the very, very end. And that's what they were asking. Lord, tell us when shall these things be and what explicitly will be the signs we see along the prophetic road to alert us to the fact that we are in the close, we are in the summation, we're in the very end, the wrap up of, the King James Version says, the world. Bad translation, the word world in Greek would be the Greek word geis, that would describe the planet, that the planet's never going to end. The world's never going to end. So that's a bad translation. The Greek word that is used here is not the word geis, not the word for the planet or the physical earth, but rather it's the Greek word ionos. And the word ionos describes an age. The New King James Version translates it correctly. What will be the sign that we are at the end of the age? Every age has a concrete beginning and has a concrete end. For example, we are now living in a time period called the last days. Sometimes it's referred to as the age of grace. Sometimes people call it the church age. But it had a concrete beginning and it will have a concrete end just like every age. There have been different age periods within the history of man. We're living in an age called the last days. We know exactly when it began to the very hour. The Bible tells us about it in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, Peter prophesies. And Peter says, In the last days I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, it was the trigger that opened the door to the church age. And from the day of Pentecost into the present moment, we have been living in a period called the church age or the age of grace. Some call it the last days. This 2,000 years we've been living in is a concrete age. It had a specific beginning. The beginning was on the day of Pentecost. And just like it had a specific beginning, it will have a specific end. And the end will be when the Lord returns for the church. And when the church is evacuated from planet Earth, this age will end. And when it ends, it will give birth to the next age, which the Bible calls the tribulation, a seven-year period. But the age we're living in is coming to an end. And that's the age the disciples were asking Jesus about. When is this age going to end? When will be the wrap-up of this age we're living in right now? When will this age close? That's what they were asking. And now Jesus answers the question and really gives them numbers of signs. But he begins in verse 4, as we saw in the last program. He says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed is a translation of the Greek word blepo, which means look, look. But it's spoken very emphatically, which means Jesus' words were intended to jar and jolt the listeners. He was trying to really get their attention. And beginning in verse 4, Jesus gives what I would call the chief, foremost, primary sign that is indicative we're living in the very closure of this age. And what is that sign? Deception. Jesus says, look, take heed, look, listen, pay attention to what I'm saying. You'll know you're in the very last days of this age when you see worldwide deception. This word deceive in verse 4 is the Greek word planel. And this word planel is a specific word which describes moral deception, or I would call this moral confusion. People who morally are wandering. And in fact, this word was used in the time of the New Testament and in secular literature of New Testament times to describe people who once walked on a very solid path. But now they have departed from that path and now they're wobbling. They're teetering on the edge of a very dangerous cliff. They've chosen to take a route that is very insecure, very unstable and treacherous. That is the word that is used here but particularly used to describe a moral departure. So now we find that generally across the planet, Jesus says, you'll know when it's the end of the age, 
because people will begin to depart from biblical, godly common sense. Those principles, those morals that built them and established them on which they built their life, they will begin departing from it. They'll leave what is solid, they'll leave what is established, they'll leave what was their foundation, and they'll try to become inclusive, embracive, and open-minded to new things, and they'll begin departing from that solid path, and society as a whole will try to take a new direction. Jesus calls this deception. And this word deceive specifically has to do with moral deception or moral wandering or moral confusion. We saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 that the Apostle Paul also refers to this, and he called it a delusion, the same Greek word planel, but there translated as the word delusion, which would come upon the entire human race at the end of the age, a moral confusion. And we discussed before that society today is so morally confused that they're making immoral decisions which they think are moral. People are so confused, they don't even know what gender they are these days. Men think they're women, women think they're men. There is a moral confusion, and unfortunately, in the world of entertainment, even the courts, is coming behind to support the moral confusion, to tell people they have a right to be morally confused. Rather than help people, this delusion is even in the courts, it's in the educational system, it's in the world of the cinema, the theater, it's everywhere, trying to wrap its tentacles around the earth, a worldwide moral delusion or deception, which Jesus prophesied in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, would be the first, foremost, and primary indicator that you've entered the end of the age. That's what Jesus said. And I think that you can see this all around us today. But Jesus took it one step further. In verse 5, he said, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. We saw this is Jesus' prophetic utterance that this worldwide delusion will even try, it will try, I'm not saying it's going to be successful, but it will try to come inside the church. That's what verse five is about. For many shall come in my name. The word in in Greek is the word epi, which means upon. They will come upon my name. It means they'll come on the strength of my name. They'll come in the name of my reputation. They'll come on my coattails. They'll come claiming to belong to me. And they'll even say, I am Christ. The word Christ, the Greek word Christos, which means they will claim, follow me because I am anointed. That's what the word Christ means. They will boast of a superior anointing or divine inspiration or that they have the ability to exegete or teach what no one else has ever been able to teach or to exegete. People will begin listening to them. But Jesus says this particular category of people will not bring truth. They will deceive many is what verse 5 says. And the word deception tells us what this particular category of false leaders will teach and preach. The word deceive, again, the Greek word planeo. This word planeo has to do with a moral faltering, a moral wandering, or a moral confusion. So these people who are in the pulpit or who have a public position to speak, rather than speak time-tested truths of Scripture, rather than lead people to the Bible and the principles that we can build our life upon, they will begin to lure people away from the clear, sound teaching of Scripture and lead them in a direction away from their foundation, away from principles that are solid, they can build their life upon, and will encourage people to be more open-minded, more inclusive of others, embracing of every kind of lifestyle. And as a result, people, will, even in the church, will begin to morally falter or morally wander or moral confusion will come to the church. That is precisely what verse 5 means. And we saw in the last program that the Apostle Paul confirms this in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, when Paul says that in the last days, some will depart from the faith. The faith in Greek has a definite article, which means this is not faith for miracles or faith for healing or faith for finances or faith for something, but it is the faith. The definite article means it's the faith. This describes the faith or the clear, sound teaching of Scripture. There will be a departure from the teaching of the Bible. That is exactly what the Apostle Paul said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. It doesn't say that people are going to reject the Bible. It says they will depart from the faith. The word depart, the Greek word, which means to slowly gravitate away from 
to be lured away from. And here we find that at the end of the age, the delusion that is in the world, the open mindedness that's in the world, the inclusiveness that's in the world will try to come inside the church and some who are in visible positions of leadership will embrace this and will encourage others, don't be so strict, don't be so rigid, be more open-minded. Maybe our interpretation of Scripture has not been right. Maybe there's another way of thinking and they will begin to change their position or change their stance and they'll begin to depart from the faith And the Apostle Paul clearly says, this is the activity of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, that's a lot. But listen to what Jesus says next in verse 6. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. He says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now in verse 6, Jesus begins to talk about worldwide catastrophic events that are going to happen at the very end of the age. And he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. First of all, Jesus says, you will hear. He doesn't say you'll see them. He doesn't say you'll personally experience them. But Jesus says, you will hear of them. And of course, because of television, the mass media, and the internet, today we are inundated with information. Our ears and our eyes are filled with information about events happening around the world. And though these events are happening far away, they feel very close to us because of media. And Jesus says in the end of the age, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. The word hear is the Greek word akoe, very important, because this word hear, the Greek word akoe, is actually the Greek word for the ear. It means, you could translate this verse, at the end of the age, your ears will be filled with information. One man has even translated this, your ears will be ringing with the sound of war. Though you may not personally see it, you will have an overload of information about wars that are happening around the world. The word war is the Greek word polemos. And this word polemos can describe an all-out war. It can describe a localized conflict, or it can describe a skirmish. And indeed, right now there are more skirmishes conflicts being fought around the globe at one time that have ever been fought in human history. And if you turn on your television, you can regularly hear about these. And Jesus says at the end of the age, that generation will have ears filled with information about wars and rumors of wars. But that's not all. If you read Luke chapter 21, verse 9, Luke adds another word which Jesus said, and I want to read it to you. It's very important. In Luke chapter 21, verse 9, Luke adds the word commotions. Wow, what does this mean? Luke chapter 21 and verse 9. It says, but you will hear of wars and commotions. And then Luke adds these words, be not terrified. First of all, the word commotions is the Greek word ada ekatastasios. It describes an upheaval or a revolution an upheaval or a revolution. Well, in our day, in our age, at the end of this age, there are upheavals and revolutions. There are orange revolutions. There are Arab revolutions. There are revolutions that are taking place all across the planet. The Bible calls these commotions, primarily localized commotions, upheavals, revolutions. Jesus says you're going to hear of them. The word hear, again, the Greek word akoi, describes the ear. You're going to have an ear full of information about polemos, skirmishes, conflicts, all-out wars, and not just that, also commotions. The word commotions means you're going to hear of localized disturbances, upheavals, revolutions. And then Jesus says in Luke 21, verse 9, be not terrified. Be not terrified. This word terrified is really the Greek word for terrorism. And in fact, when you read this in Greek, it says, be not. The Greek means over a period of time, don't become affected. It describes something that comes to pass gradually. And here we have the picture of people, people in society around the world, inundated by an ear full of information, which gradually over a period of time begins to affect how they live, how they think, how they travel, until they are terrorized by acts of terrorism. Well, in the time of the New Testament, there was a lot of terrorism. 
there were local uprisings against Roman authority. And no one ever knew when an act of terrorism was going to take place. An act of terrorism caused people to be startled, to be troubled, and to have a sense of panic because you didn't know when it was coming or where it was going to come from. You never knew who to suspect because these were acts of terrorism. And now Jesus says, be not terrified. The Greek word for terrorism. One man has translated this, be not terrorized. And Jesus, again, is describing events that are going to happen at the very end of the age. So now we know from verse 4, at the very end of the age, there's going to be a worldwide delusion, a worldwide deception. We know from verse 5, this deception is going to try to find its way into the church. If we preachers and believers do a good job of hanging on to the Word of God, we will stop its entrance into the church. But then when we come to verse 6, we find in addition to deception in the world and in the church, there is going to be wars, an ear full of information about conflicts, skirmishes, conflicts, and not just that, commotions, upheavals, revolutions, disturbances. And Luke tells us even acts of terrorism. But Luke says something very important. In Luke 21, verse 9, he says, But the end is not by and by. Just because you're hearing of wars and rumors of wars, upheavals, conflicts, disturbances, commotions, even acts of terrorism, this does not mean the end is by and by, or the Greek literally means this is not the all-important sign that the end is imminent. These things are going to happen as a part of the last days, but it's not the all-important sign. These things are going to happen. Then we read in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6 again. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, the Greek word of Koi, an earful of information about wars. See that you be not troubled. This is so very important. In Greek, there is a negative, which makes this a prohibition. Jesus wasn't just saying, try not to be troubled. He was saying, see that you're not troubled. Make a determination that you're not going to be rattled. You're not going to be startled. You're not going to be terrorized. You're not going to submit to the fear which tries to pervade the world at the end of the age. You know, I do a lot of international travel, and everywhere you travel, there are signs warning of terrorism, and you have to check things at the airport, and people are constantly on alert, and there are certain statuses around the world to let us know how bad is the threat of terrorism. Jesus warned us in these verses, this would be a sign that you've entered the very end of the age. And he said, do not give sway to this. Do not give way to this. Do not be rattled. Do not be startled. Don't give way to panic. For all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The word end here, the Greek word telos, you've not reached the end. You've not reached the conclusion. Not yet. Then Jesus says in verse 7, For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in divers places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, when we come back in the next program, we're going to look at verse 7. What does the Bible mean when it says, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom shall rise against kingdom? What does the Bible mean when it says there will be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in divers places? Such a critical verse that in verse 8, Jesus says these are the beginning of sorrows. The word sorrows is the Greek word which describes a woman that is in labor about to give birth. Or according to Jesus, just as a woman's contractions become closer and harder as she approaches the moment of delivery, Jesus says the earth, society, the planet, mankind, the closer we come to the end, these signs, like labor pains, will come closer and closer and closer and closer together until you feel they're nearly piled on top of one another. And Jesus says, when you see all these things happening so quickly together, it is the sign that you're coming right to the moment of delivery when this age ends and it will give birth to another age. All of that in Matthew chapter 24, and we're just getting started, but today we're out of time. But I want to remind you that if you need prayer, we're here for you. And we would love to hear from you. We really believe in prayer in our ministry. And when people contact us, we are very serious about praying for their needs. So contact us. Use the information that is on the screen. And in closing, I want to remind you, as always, from Ecclesiastes 8, verse 4, it says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let the word of God release its power in your life today. And I'll see you 
in the next program. Rick Renner's message, A Prophetic Alert, brings present-day illumination to 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. This sobering message is a Holy Spirit alert, not to scare you, but to prepare you as Rick encourages and edifies you with necessary wisdom for the days ahead. This important message is our special gift to you this month. Visit our website at renner.org to download this free audio message along with a PDF of corresponding study notes to help you dig deeper into the Word of God. Just Before Jesus Comes is the powerful new book by Rick Renner that carefully outlines the prophetic signs that Jesus stated would indicate his soon return and the very end of this period of time. Jesus described these specific signs in great detail so we would recognize them when we saw them and understand how to use what he said to navigate the road ahead. Some signs relate to social, moral, and political changes, and others are associated with physical signs in the earth and its atmosphere. Considered altogether, these signs indicate that we are poised to cross over from one era into another. Jesus is coming sooner than you think. Order your copy today of Just Before Jesus Comes so you can recognize the clear and increasing signs that identify where we are in God's prophetic timeline and what we can expect to see on the road ahead. My name is Joel Renner, and I want to tell you just briefly about some facets of our ministry. Through the years, we have started our TV ministry that has potentially affected millions and millions of lives. We have also started several churches in the former Soviet Union, and our main church is here in Moscow. But besides pastoring our central Moscow church, my father and mother, Rick and Denise Renner, still maintain their public ministry and travel around the globe, sharing God's love and teaching to those who are eager to hear it. Of course, my parents write books and publish books and we have spread those books around the globe. We have translated them in many languages, and we're still doing that so that more and more people can hear about God's Word. Besides publishing and writing books, we also have our local outreaches, where we minister in orphanages, to drug and alcohol hospitals, prisons, mental institutions, and we help the homeless. Every week, we have a ministry specifically for senior citizens who are former communists, and we are able to help them and teach them about Christ, where they can hear about Him and learn what the Bible says for the first time. Of course, we have our seminary training center, where we equip believers who want to know more about God with an education so they can go out and them, themselves, be able to teach others. These are just a few facets of our ministry, and I am so grateful that I can share them with you. Thank you for helping us so we can go out and help others.